Okay, we've, we've explored the uh, Native Americans. We've talked about the French, all right? And one theme that's been kind of running through the whole thing has been water, all right? We've been talking about French Creek. We've been talking about the Allegheny. So now we're going to figure out the water technology, and we have the State Museum here to talk about that. So this topic will be on the Pennsylvania Dugout Canoe Project, deciphering the past through experimental uh, archaeology, and our presenter is uh, an old buddy, uh, Jim Herbstritt. Mr. Herbstritt is a historic preservation specialist and senior archaeologist with the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. Prior to that, he directed archaeology of field investigations for Costatuga Valley Archaeology Consultants Incorporated and co-directed field operations for the University of Pittsburgh Cultural Resource Management Program in Utah. In the early 1980s, Mr. Herbstritt was the regional archaeologist for the Region 2 California University of Pennsylvania. His research interests include the evolution of late woodland settlement and substance systems of the Susquehanna Valley and the European Viking history. And if you were with us last year, he was our presenter on the McFate site. So he's a comeback guy for the second time. So we're very, really pleased to have Jim back with us again. Jim Herbstick. Well, I must admit I'm not Bill Clinton. I'm not the comeback kid, but by golly, we'll give it a try for the comeback guy today. Uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me uh, to participate in this wonderful experience here in northwestern Pennsylvania. I don't often have the opportunity to return, and I say return in the sense that years ago when I was at California University of Pennsylvania as a regional archaeologist, my travels would bring me up into northwestern Pennsylvania periodically to look at different things prehistorically and archaeologically related. Well, this year, You've, you've, the folks came to me and asked us if we could present the program on the uh, experimental archaeology and the this development of watercraft through experimental archaeology. And we, there are three parts to this that we're going to talk about today. The discovery, or I should say the research, the discovery, and then the experimentation, or what we call as our, in the archaeological community, middle range research simply means that you take something that you find in the soil as archaeologists and then one tends to think about that for a while and then replicate it and try and use it in its own sense, in its own environment. And that's what we're going to do here today with the Dugout Canoe Project presentation. Dugout canoes, as we know to some extent, extend back quite uh, for a long period in time. They go back at least uh, 6,000 years ago, radiocarbon years in the southeastern United States. But they probably go back much further than that. A recent trend has been to uh, equate, equate the uh, uh, dugout canoe uh, model and trans transmission development from the old world into the new world. Uh, the peopling of the new world by way of watercraft and that's the second theory that's now being considered that rather than going overland from Europe the many of these early Americans or paleo-Americans came to the region uh, in including our region here over time by way of watercraft or by way of the coast if you just think for a moment the biodiversity of the coast as opposed to the biodiversity of an inland environment there's really no comparison there's everything that you really need to subsist and survive by way of the coast. And then once these people, and again, this is all hypothetical, although there are some sites that have been discovered along the coast that are, have a great deal of antiquity to them that would indeed support and foster the idea that watercraft was in fact one of the principal methods used to, in peopling the new world. In our area, there were a number of different kinds of watercraft. When I say our area, I mean Pennsylvania and essentially the northeastern United States, including parts of the Middle Atlantic and then on into the southeastern United States. Birch bark canoes were, of course, used in the northern hemisphere where the materials would have been available for their manufacture. 
Here in Pennsylvania, although we do have some birch bark, they are not of the size or magnitude that would have been necessary to create dugout canoes. Instead, we have some ethno-historic or ethnographic references of, of canoes being made with elm bark, the so-called Haninoshani or Iroquois as I continue to call them, were, were, making, dug, uh, were making canoes out of uh, elm bark. Also, uh, the second type of canoe that we find, which we're going to be principally talking about today, is the simple dugout. The term pretty much defines itself. A dugout canoe is just that. It's a log that the interior of the log has been dug out or burned out to create a craft, uh, a, a container that one could jump inside and float down a body of water. This is a John White drawing on the, those that you can see the illustration of uh, a 1585 John White drawing of several Amerindians or Native Americans working on the construction of a dugout canoe. Uh, I'll describe, even though the, the illustrations really aren't uh, evident, I can describe that in the background you can see a tree that has been felled, fire has been built around the base of the tree, and through hacking away with stone tools and adding more flame to the fire, uh, eventually the tree would fall over. In the foreground you can see the dugout canoe being set up on a set of st uh, wooden stands and the interior is being cut out. Now this, you have to realize that this is a, a very Europeanized drawing or wood, wood cut that represents, uh, I should say, some ethnocentrism involved where uh, this is kind of what a European would, would envision a dugout canoe to look like. If you look at the, the angular cuts of the interior of the canoe and uh, the, on, the, on the exterior of the angular cuts as well, you'll see that through the examples that we'll be showing today that that wasn't necessarily the case. They're the oldest constructed watercraft that we know of here in uh, the Americas. In the southeastern United States, in, excuse me, in the northwestern part of the United States, the, the huge dugouts made out of cedar uh, were used for whaling, watercrafting back and forth uh, to islands using along the coast. And the big war canoes were in excess of 60 feet long and carried as many as 40 warriors. Our dugout canoes weren't that large. Lewis and Clark Expedition, 1805. They formed over a two-week period a series of dugouts, constructing dugouts for travel down the river, down through the Missouri River Valley. Although these renditions, I'm not sure really are what they look like. It's the artist's rendition that we see. They look to me more like Northwest Coast, Nootka, Tlingit, Salish, and so on. That's the uh, advantage of, of, of making your own drawings sometimes. Some Native American dugouts were painted and carved with clan symbols. We heard from Becky this morning about how important the uh, clan aspect of, of leaking in or dovetailing in people in their communities of tribal groups and the, uh, uh, the, the Im implications that this all brought about of how people became cohesive through their own tribes and their clans. So here's an example, again, of a Northwest Coast dugout canoe that shows some clan symbols on the side of the canoe. One of the most interesting dugout canoes that I have had the opportunity to wit personally view and witness is on exhibit at the McClung Museum in Tennessee. 32 feet long, it's the longest one that I know of uh, from the eastern United States. It was found after a large flood floating down the river and it was salvaged and now it resides in the museum. It's a wonderful piece of uh, workmanship. If you ever make it down there, please Please take that in to uh, put, it, put that on your, uh, on your list. Dugout canoes were generally sh shallow drafted craft. We, we talk about them being paddled, and, and in, in fact, we actually paddled a dugout canoe, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. But in, here is another white drawing. This is a white watercolor down in uh, the Virginia, Carolina area fish weirs in the back and they're out there using these dugout canoes. They're pulling them along, typically pulling them along 
in shallow water. They have a, the canoes that we've built have a, an ex, had an exceedingly shallow draft to them, as much as four to as, as little as four to six inches. So you could essentially work around uh, water and shallow water where you could uh, net insane fish and travel from river bank to island and so on. The large war canoes we talk about, we see that along the lower Mississippi, particularly of, uh, during the, uh, the Spanish period, the Spanish domination of uh, North America. It's interesting how, how Europe cut out their own sections of America where you had the French in the north, the earliest, uh, right along with the Spanish in the southeast, about the same time. And, uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the Dutch in New York in the upper stages, uh, the upper reaches of uh, the Delaware Valley, the, the English in the Susquehanna Valley, and later on the Swedes. And then, of course, here in northwestern Pennsylvania, you had the French. And I had mentioned earlier about the birch bark canoe. They were kind of nice craft, and I'm sure they would have used them if, in fact, they would have been available. And my guess is that this is the sort of craft, unless historical data suggests otherwise, that these were the kinds of crafts that Celeron and LaSalle, I should say LaSalle, would have used to portage from one location to the other. Dugout canoes are not very, very light things. They're very durable, but they're not very light. The present canoe that we have at the State Museum weighs in excess of 400 pounds. When it was fresh, cut from the Michaud State Forest, the log weighed over a ton, over 2,000 pounds. And again, they were used along rivers, primarily for trade, expansion of the uh, capacity for, for gaining food for the groups of people uh, living in those regions. An incredible discovery was made years ago in uh, central Florida, not far from Gainesville, at a place called Noonan's Lake. And a series of dugout canoes, and this particular slide shows us that there was 55 prehistoric canoes found. Now there's since been this, since this has been published, there's been over 100 of these canoes that were found beached along the lake edge. And uh, the uh, receding water, the drawing down of the water lakes over, over this clim these climatic deteriorations exposed a lot of these, and some of them were preserved. They're as old as 5,000 years. Now, why were these things preserved? Obviously, we know where to look for dugout canoes, along a lake bed or along a river, and you hear about different kinds of stories where these things have been found. The reason, the principal reason that these things are, are preserved is that they end up in an anaerobic environment or an environment where there's very little oxygen. And this is what preserves them, keeps them from the, the, you know, the biological aspect of it. You don't have uh, uh, wood worms, you don't have other insects, other, other things that, that can actually get in there and eat, eat, eat away at it. So this slide here is a stratigraphic profile that shows what what a, one of these dugout canoes in a good state of preservation would look like as it's buried in its sediment. Now, archaeologists and other researchers, uh, watercraft researchers, have tended to uh, use the, the Linnaean the method of, of assessing something or putting it into a category, and we try to organize things in our in our very real world, in our biological world, we use species and genus and so on and so forth. Well, in this world, we can only use differences in morphology. So what we do is we, when these things are found, we kind of put them in their own little category. And the examples from Noonan show that there was an overshot bow and sometimes an overshot stern. They had uh, interesting uh, places that you could park your body on for rowing them or, or towing them, uh, pulling them, and so on. So they've, they've classified these things into different categories. The, in spite of all that classification, it doesn't seem to help us in terms of the chronology of dugout canoes. I guess it's just being human over a period of time and you're making your own kind of canoe. You want to put your, your seat somewhere that, that's going to be uh, appropriate for your own, uh, for your own use. 
Some had no seats, some were just simply carved out. Fewer than 20, actually there's only about 10, have been, dugout canoes have been found in Pennsylvania. And most of these have been found around lake or lacustrian regions, and not riverine environments, such you would find around the immediate area here of French Creek. However, Pimatuning Swamp, Pimatuning Lake, all these other glacial lakes that relate, uh, that are glacial rel relics of, of 10 to 20,000 20, or so years ago, would have been ideal locations for people who came into the region and be began colonizing, exploiting the resources from them. Dugout canoes would have been I ideal. And I would think that Pimatuning Swamp, the lake area, would be a, a, a very, very good focal point to begin looking for these things. We have one, speaking of insects, I have one in my eye. Uh, we have a, a dugout canoe on exhibit at the State Museum Hall of Anthropology. It came from Mud Pond. It's a small glacial kettle lake in Wayne, uh, Pike County. The Pocono uplands where, where most of the uh, canoes are, are found. There have been several others. The Lake Wallen Pawpack, which is not too terribly far from there, is, uh, is another canoe that's in the Everhart Museum. The one that we have at the State Museum, the Mud Pond Canoe, we've actually sampled it radio, in radiocarbon years. At day, the radiocarbon date is roughly AD 1250 plus or minus 60 years. And the way you do that, it's like when you, that's the advantage of having a tree where you can look at the tree rings and each, theoretically, each tree ring, although there are issues of double rings and things like that, but we won't go into that at, at, in this lecture. Each of the rings is a calendar year. And so if you know a beginning date or an ending date, you can determine how old that tree is. In most cases, there's always the exception to the rule. That seems to be the case in everything that we do these days. Radiocarbon analysts will take a log and they'll cut, they'll cut the rings out and they'll say they'll, they'll take a specific ring, say the date, say the tree dates to the most recent ring uh, suggests that the tree is uh, 4,000 years old, for example. Well, they'll go back in that log and they'll cut out the 2,000-year-old ring, the one at 1,000, the one at 500, and so on, and they'll radiocarbon date those specific rings, and that will give them a radiocarbon, a, 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 a con converted radiocarbon date or a corrected radiocarbon date that gives us the precise difference between the radiocarbon date of through, through, uh, through our science and the absolute date of the ring through the tree itself. So when you see radiocarbon dates, they'll often have a, uh, a connector to it, and it the connector will be a calibrated radiocarbon date. And that's how a calibrated radiocarbon date is developed. Again, more views of the, uh, of the dugout canoe from the State Museum. Well, it really got exciting when two gentlemen, two fishermen from up in uh, Waypoint, pardon me, Waymark, Pennsylvania, gave us a call and said, we have a dugout canoe floating out in Curtis Pond. Oh, and we think it's old and we think it's Native American. So of course we were very interested in it because all objects that are found in the waterways of Pennsylvania belong to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So we went up there and we looked at it and we said, yes, this looks like a dugout canoe. We need to do something with it. It's about four and a half meters long, roughly 15 feet in length, about 60 centimeters in rough diameter, roughly uh, a foot and a half to 18 inches or so. And uh, so what we did, we figured out a way to uh, actually retrieve the dugout canoe and then conserve it. This is an illustration here of us uh, going uh, out into uh, uh, Curtis Pond. We built kind of a little quasi-catamaran with two uh, canoes and uh, slung it and brought it back to the opposite shore. And then we, uh, it, it, had, it, it was a bad time of the year. We couldn't take it out. We really weren't ready to, to do this sort of thing. So I said, let's re we said, let's regroup 
and come up with a strategy. So in the meantime, the weather's getting colder and colder, and our conservator, Brian Howard from the State Museum, suggested that we take a piece of plastic culvert, drain culvert, and then sleeve it over the, uh, over the dugout canoe for the winter, because once the lake freezes over, there's a great deal of pressure on the sides of the canoe. If you, uh, you just think about some of the ships that were uh, frozen in the Arctic and unable to move, it actually crushed the bows of the, the ship's bodies. Well, what we did, we, we did that, and interestingly enough, the, the, the black plastic or polymer that we used uh, generated enough heat over the course of the winter through the sun that that area around the canoe never, it did not freeze over. So it was a matter of us, just for us to go in the spring and retrieve it, which we did. So what do we do with this kind of like a white elephant after you buy one, what do you feed it and how do you treat it and all that. So, well, we wanted to keep it local. The fragility of the issue, it was, the fragility was an issue. We were concerned about vibrating transportation on the highways and so on. And part of the, this, the stern had already been, had, was, was already missing since the two gentlemen uh, who discovered the canoe decided to hook on it with their fishing boat and tow it from one side of the lake to the other and the, the, the stern part was never, never recovered. So once we got it out and we're, we've got it up on a flatbed, a Rec Wreckers flatbed, we were able to take it to the Eberhardt Museum in Scranton for conservation. They agreed to uh, allow us to use their facilities there. And so we did, we took it there and on the, be my right, your left on the screen, we created a box, uh, kind of like a crypt as it were. We set the canoe down in it and immersed it with polyethylene glycol. It's a process of replacing, it forces, the, the, the chemi chemicals force the water out of the wood and at the same time pulls in the, uh, the pipe polyethylene glycol solution. And over about a two month period, most of the water was removed to the point where we could actually remove the canoe from, from the uh, location and then, uh, and, and then prepare it for exhibition, which is what happened at the, uh, at the uh, Eberhardt uh, Museum. Once we, once we left there, the middle school at Waymart in uh, Wayne County agreed to put it on permanent display. So that's where it is. And if you're ever in Waymart, visit the middle school and you'll see it. Now, the last part of the program is the experimentation part. In, in 2000, 2000, we built the first canoe. I don't have photographs of that one. The second canoe we built, it ended in failure. The, it takes a lot of burning to create one of these things and the individuals who were watching this process, the burning of the process, who were on duty at the time. I don't know what happened. They, they left, fell asleep, and the thing burned apart. We ended up with two surfboards, as it were. So the third canoe we, we created and launched it from City Island in Harrisburg and paddled it to the mouth of Chesapeake Bay over a five-day period. That canoe was approximately 18 feet long, made from uh, white pine that we were able to obtain from a Michaux State Forest. Now, in 2005, the old the number three canoe was falling apart and it was sitting out at Fort Hunter and we decided, okay, well, we're going to build a fourth one. And so in 2005, we contacted Mich Michaux State Forest, which is in, near Gettysburg, near South Mountain. And it just so happened that there was a huge ice storm that had gone through that winter that had taken down a series of large pines. So we were able to harvest one of the uh, pine trees and we ended up with a log that was 21 foot long, roughly 21 foot long, and weighed over or close to or right in that area of one ton. And it was delivered by Michelle. Those, those guys, they're great. They did all the work for us. They brought, it, brought the log to uh, Fort Hunter and in the fall of, Fort, uh, of 2005, as part of our public outreach program, we decided that in addition to the archeology span that we do there every year, we decided that it would be really nice if we could add a, a, a facet to the program by uh, creating uh, the fifth or the fourth dugout canoe. So here it is uh, on the picture there after it was 
finished, but we're going to go through this general process of how we did this. And the way experimental archaeology works is that when you find something, you start thinking about how it might have been made or what it might have been used for. And through the ethno-historic record, we find that many of these canoes, like the John White drawings and that sort of thing, uh, that, that, that sort of historic record, that the Native Americans or Amerindians that I call were using uh, adzes, stone adzes. And so what we did, we were able to obtain uh, a type of very, very hard or indurated material, almost a granite-like material from Virginia, although there are deposits of it here in, in Pennsylvania as well. But it was appropriate to get it from Virginia because we knew the archaeologist down there and he had a whole pile of this stuff. So rather than go out and find it ourselves, he sent us samples of, of, the, uh, of the basalt. It's a igneous rock, very hard igneous rock. And these are some of the uh, tools that we used. We made them by hand, ground them down, chipped and ground them down, hafted them into handles, various forms of hafts were used, and through this whole process we, dis we determined what was good and what was not good in terms of the technique. The haft on the right, right broke with the first chop. It was poorly made, poorly hafted, the one on the left. These things don't look like much, but they do work. And here's the blade. Uh, after it had broken, removed, decided to put another one in it. And here is Andrea, one of our, excuse me, one of our lab people, uh, shaping uh, the new ads blade. Requires very minor maintenance to uh, once you have the blade made. Our idea here was to take this, these blades at the end and look at them and compare the edge wear uh, with the prehistoric adzes that we have in the collection to determine if edge wear was kind of, a, if you will, a fingerprint in terms of how, what what the adzes were being used for, the ones that we have in the collection. That you know that information's lost. The people that made those that it, uh, those adzes, their faces are lost. So you know it, we only have the the material objects to work with. So this is what middle range research or experimental archaeology is all about. And th this is a sampling of the different tools that we use. The one in the middle is it's nothing but, but a large straight adze that we put into a handle and use it as a shuttle. And here are the tools. They held up quite well. Okay, we talked about the diameter, Michaud State Forest. The burning and shaping, this is an interesting process. And again, using the information from the John White woodcuts and the watercolors, we were able to replicate this methodology. You begin by burning the log, of course, at the very, very top. But the problem with it is, one of the principal problems is getting it to burn right. What I mean by that is that if you do not have control or barriers along the side, the log will burn in any direction depending on how the wind blows. So wind, wind plays a very important part here. So what we did, we started by lining the top with a, a, a very thick layer of river clay, and then we built the fire inside that. And that allowed it, the, the the uh, burning to, to take place vertically down into the wood. Once the charring occurred, you move the fire from, to, from one end of the canoe to the other, and you start chipping, chipping it out with these adzes that we've made. And here is a, an example of how that works. Now here's the, the next slide shows you how, uh, how we used the mud, the uh, plastering of the walls. So when you burned it, the next burn would, would not uh, work in the, to the side wall. Here's another example of that. Again, it works as a very good insulator, heat, uh, insulating it from the, from the heat. There's a major burn going on. We start out with, our, in our term, kindling wood, small twigs and dried saplings. And you, you have to control the fire. This is the important thing. Otherwise, you, you end up with really, really major problems. And here's a close-up of what you, what you have here. Of course, the mud turns into a fired clay, and you can see how it shrinks and cracks as it dries out, so it then falls off. You have to clean all that out to continue you know, your burn with new clay and so on. Here, here we are again, adzing away. 
Once the general shape, uh, the outside shape is achieved, it is, it's just, just a simple matter to repeat the, the mudding process and continue until you're, you're through with the uh, process. And in the course of this all, we had, great, we had a great time with the visitors. Here's a bunch of young kids helping with the mudding of the sides. And they, they really got into it and their face paintings and all that. 400 days is a great time of the year for us in the Harrisburg area. We have people from all walks of life come in. With fa it's a family day. And in this case, the dugout canoe project was a real draw. Here we are burning it again. As you can see, this whole process takes time. We worked on it for about four hours a day for 17 days until we had the final product. And here we have another, another view of it. A lot of repetition here, but I think it's important to show some of this because of what we had to go through in order to do it. Here's another part of the uh, flaking process. Uh, we're getting down to uh, the final end of it, and uh, we found that through the learning process, you always learn by your mistakes, don't we? And uh, this was no exception. The early canoes, when you look at the ethnographic or the ethnological examples, the canoe walls, the gunnels are very thin. Well, we did that with the first two canoes, but we, we had problems with that, uh, with the, the, uh, the integrity of the wood. It started drying out and flaking and that sort of thing. So the last dugout canoe was a bull's, bull's canoe. It has really thick walls. We put it on exhibit every year at, uh, at the farm show, which you'll see pictures of. And here's the final burn. More pictures of, uh, of that. Now the final burn is, um, you, you just, we're just simply uh, parching, if you will. Use the term parch. Very small saplings are put in there just to, to uh, how shall I say it, finalize the, uh, the, the, the shape of the interior. And then the bow and stern had to be adzed out. They were burned as well and then chipped away. To make it smooth, we took nothing more than uh, rough pieces of sandstone, which would have been available to the Amerindians uh, anywhere. Break up a cobble from the glacial till, start rubbing along the tops and the sides, just like you would take uh, you know, a normal piece of sandpaper or a sanding block in your wood shop. And that's the almost the, near the final end, we took then uh, a, a pitch that's used, uh, uh, fer uh, farriers use it, uh, horseshoers, they'll, they'll take a pitch, a cup pitch, and put it in the bottom of the horse's hoof, and uh, that helps seal. We used it to help seal the uh, cracks in the canoe, because whenever you burn something like this, it dries and shrinks out. And we, did, we did have some cracking going on. Now we looked at the edge wear of the tools. Well, what we found out is that the edges showed a very, very uh, interesting, consistent pattern of straight striations. We didn't expect to see that because the prehistoric adzes and axes that we look at don't have this kind of edge wear on them. They have a very, very high polish, or medium, low polish. They're very smooth. The, the bit ends, the business cutting ends are very smooth. We didn't find that here with the dugout. Now, we don't know if if it's a if it's an if, if it's a botany issue with with phytoliths in the wood, we don't know anything like that. Because are there differences between different woods where this might occur? Maybe, maybe not. But what we used was a pine log, uh, and uh, and we ended up with striations on the edge of the of the. Pine. We also used uh, a meta rhyolite. It's a volcanic. Uh, meta, meta volcanic rock from the South Mountain area, which people call it rhyolite. It's a kind of a gray stone. And that held up very well as opposed to the uh, basalt. And again, the edge wear is the same. Striations. This is a cache of uh, axes and adzes that we found on City Island that date to the late archaic period, which is about the same period of the Noonan canoes down in uh, Florida. And we kind of gave us the idea, well, let, let's Let's make some of these up and, and use them. But again, the archaeological examples have all very, very smooth cut edges as opposed to what we ended up with. There's the cache from City Island. These, this is the distribution of adzes across Pennsylvania. Not all adzes because, you know, wherever you go, someone will come up to you and say, well, I've collected Indian, Indian artifacts on the farm and I found this stone axe 
and it turns out to be a stone axe or an adze. So that you could probably double or triple the, the dots in that distribution map with, with, uh, with ease. Here are some more adzes and axes. So the fun part is yet to come. Once we finish the dugout canoe at Fort Hunter after 17 days of blood, sweat, and some tearing, <laughs> we uh, launched it at the Fish Commission boat ramp there at, at Fort Hunter. By the, with the good graces of the Fish Commission, we didn't have to fill out the form and get the prop, you know, get the, the number and all. But we were required to wear life jackets, and so we did that, and uh, there we are going down to Susquehanna. This canoe has a carrying capacity of about 1,500 pounds with a draft, uh, with, with, with clearance on the, uh, on the sideboards of about, mm, I would have to say maybe two inches. The, it, the other interesting thing about these dugouts, at least the ones that we've made, is that we had lots of fun with them in the river. You could stand up on the gunnel, kind of balance yourself and dive off into the river. <laughs> And the, the dugout would, would swing down, take a little bit of water on, and come back up again. But the trick is to keep a lot of the wood or ballast in the bottom of them. That's the trick. You've got to have the center of gravity. The ones that we find are very thin. They must have been very difficult. They don't have keels on the bottom that we know of. And uh, so they would have been somewhat difficult to manipulate in rapids and that sort of thing. So I suspect, again, that one of their principal uses were on lacustrian, in lacustrian environments, such as Pymatuning Lake and so on. Uh, back then, of course, not the modified version that we're looking at now, but the, the part where the swamp is now located. And we're getting close here to the end. We got a couple of river shots. And then we take the dugout canoe. Every year we go to the Pennsylvania Farm Show. Who's all been to the Farm Show here? Oh, yes, we have a few. That's great. It brings in a lot of people. And what we do every year, we have our own exhibit there with the dugout. This is our executive director here, James Vaughn, and his staff behind him there in the dugout. And uh, everybody's having fun. And then what? This is Bandit. Bandit sat in the dugout canoe. He's a little motorcycle uh, uh, dog that uh, his owner brought in and said, could Bandit sit in there? Sure, put Bandit in there. What? <laughs> and that's my last slide. This is the Mercer tile at the Pennsylvania State Capitol. Henry Chapman Mercer had a large pottery uh, in, near Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and he made all kinds of different tiles that are now on the, he, he was contracted by the museum to build, uh, to make these tiles, and they're embedded all through the capital. And one of the tiles is uh, American Indian in, in a canoe. So thank you very much. If we have time, I'll answer a question or two. <laughs> question, right here. Uh, dugout canoes primarily made from conifers, or did they use hardwoods as well? well principally, Principally conifers. Now, can, for example, in the southeast, it was cypress. In the northeast, what we have found through the analysis of the wood, it's uh, it, pine astrobus or suga canadensis, uh, either pine or hemlock. Probably other woods could have been used, but we don't have any evidence for that, only because we don't have the, the, art, the artifact to collect. Yes? I might have covered this, I missed the beginning of your presentation. But they start up with the log. How did they make the top part of it flat? You burn it down. You start very narrow with the clay, and you put the clay dam around it. The clay dam is only going to be about eight inches. Once you get it down in, the burning and hacking away, then you can expand, you can widen your clay base, and then cut it. But yeah, it's just essentially burning. You're removing one half of the circumference of the log. Still That's right. The, the, yeah, the one picture there of the Noonan canoe shows it as nothing more than a you know a hemisphere shaped sort of thing or a tangent cylinder. Yes. Uh, earlier, earlier in the presentation, you said that the first work that you always sell that's on the this area would that be a no suitable trade? Yeah. The question was about again about the birch bark canoe. Uh, we just simply. 
as I understand it, talking with uh, with uh, biologists, that birch bark could, uh, trees were not of the size necessary to build a dugout canoe. Now, of course, dugout canoes were sections were were stitched and patched together and all of that sort of thing. But that's the explanation I get from the, from the biologists. Elm bark, on the other hand, you could make elm bark canoes easily, and there's some good e examples that have survived of elm bark. And they, they essentially just take and strip the bark off and fold it up and uh, tie it off at the front and tie it off at the end with a, with a rib superstructure. And uh, it serves as a, a pretty decent watercraft, as I understand it. Other questions? Uh, when they were not used, did they sink them? Yeah, that's a good point. Oftentimes in these lacustrian environments, they would take uh, the, the people using them right into historic times. They would submerge them under the water, just load them up with cobbles until they wanted to use them again because they will dry out. Once, they, once this drying process starts, it, uh, it will destroy the canoe over time. And in, in French, I believe it's Gano. 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 That, that's sure, the limit sure, of sure. my friend. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. We didn't put anything on it other than the uh, pitch. The, the pitch. The. Well, you could use bear grease, and you know we're talking about animals earlier here in the in the program about uh, clan symbols and all that. Uh, bears, for example, were were used were kept as pets in some of the. Huron villages, you know, and yeah, and other turkeys were, I'm sure, walking around everywhere in some of these villages. That's those are two principal types of uh, critters that you find in archaeological contexts. Was the pitch used on the inside or inside and out? Principally on the inside, and then in the bow and stern, we used the adzes. Once we burned it, charred it, then we used the adzes to shape things with, inside and out. But essentially, the canoe itself, the exterior of the canoe, was, was untouched. We just stripped the bark off of it and used it that way. Any other questions before I leave? Okay, well thanks a lot.